Right, Hello. so there is a... All right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. This is our first joint event together with uh, virtual DDD Meetup. My name is Casper. I'm the organizer of DDD London. The other person that's helping to run uh, tonight's uh, event is Kenny. And our guest Hello. for tonight, Hello, Kenny. Our guest for tonight is Matthew Skelton. Hi, Matthew. Hi, Matthew. Can I ask uh, ask you to introduce yourself and you know tell us a, a word uh, about you know your book as well? Sure. Hi, folks. Good to be here. So I'm the co-author of this book, Team Topologies, which is all about organizing uh, business and technology teams for fast flow of change uh, when building software systems. All right. Thank you. So. Our topic for tonight are the independent service heuristics. Uh, so this is something that Matthew and Mayo were working on. Uh, and the intention for tonight's evening is, you know, to make it interactive. So, so there will be some discussion, there will be, there will be some slides and introduction to the topic, but really hope you will be able to participate as well. There will be a couple of ways of, of part, uh, how we can participate. Uh, so you can raise your hand on the participant list. Uh, we'll be monitoring that list, and then we can uh, allow you to talk for a couple of minutes. We can also uh, write your questions in the chat. We also have the Q&A enabled, but I think chat and the, the participant list and raising hands is the preferred way of uh, you know, get, getting in touch with us. So I will head over to Matthew, if you can please introduce us to the topic and to the heuristics that you put together. Thanks, Casper. It's good to be here. So first of all, I should say I'm not a DDD expert at all. I don't consider myself in, in that kind of space. I'm, I'm here to learn uh, as well as share some, some experience with, uh, with, with you all this evening. Um, I have some slides. And what I'd like to do is to kind of show some of those, but then get quite quickly into some discussion. Um, because I think that's where most of the learning, the most useful learning will, will take place this evening, certainly for me, hopefully for, for you as well. Um, uh, so I think what I'll do is share my screen. Bear with me one second. Uh, Casper, I think you need to allow, allow me to share my screen. All right. Kenny, I will have to yep. ask you. To no, yeah. Okay. No, you should. Aha, yep, that's good. Thank you. So, so I've I've sort of jokingly called this DDD Light. I I haven't actually registered a trademark for DDD Light. Don't worry about it. It's not it's not actually a thing. Um, but it feels it feels to me like. Um, uh, what I'll show you is a, is a bit like a very, very lightweight version of some aspects of DDD, which is kind of why I'm here, here this evening with, with you as, a, as, a, uh, as attendees. Um, I'll go into some detail in a second. So here's the, here's the book. So this is uh, Team Topologies, and it's published by IT Revolution Press in September 2019. And IT Revolution published uh, lots of well-known books the DevOps Handbook, uh, Phoenix Project, um, Unicorn Project, uh, Project, sorry, Project of Product, uh, Accelerate, these kind of books. And there's a brand new book out, in fact, today called Agile Conversations, which is uh, worth having a look at. So it's a nice family of books that all kind of relate to effective software delivery in, in a modern context. Before we go any further, it's worth just looking at this word topology. What does it even mean? So it comes from a Greek word, which means the way in which constituent parts are interrelated or arranged. So in the context of team topologies, this is about how teams are interrelated or arranged. And so any of you who are familiar with um, kind of DDD context will start to think, ah, yes, I understand how this is relevant now, because if we're thinking about um, kind of bounded context and kind of domains, then we've got teams kind of aligned to a particular kind of bounded context or, or domain. And so the way in which we arrange our team starts to enable a kind of DDD approach to kind of software architecture, software delivery, and so on. Um, just a little bit of context. Uh, the, the ideas that, um, that kind of uh, led up to the book uh, have been used in lots of organizations around the world. So, for example, uh, the, the, 
the, the, the pre, kind of previous version of the ideas in the book were used at Netflix. So Philip Fisher Ogden, who's the director of engineering at Netflix, is uh, tweeted, uh, I think, a couple of years ago, saying thanks for your insightful articulation of DevOps topologies and so on. They helped to kind of to inspire Netflix to understand how to how to change their organization. And the earlier versions have also been used at places like Condé Nast, the large uh, international publisher. Uh, so Crystal Hirshhorn, uh, who's based in London, actually, uh, saying your topological models resonated extremely well and she liked the different perspectives for each for each pattern. So they have been really useful. Um, and we're, we're, we're finding the, the material in the book itself um, also very useful. Uh, lots of organizations are telling us that they're, that they're, that they're finding them very useful. Um, you could sort of see the patterns in the book as some tools for a digital operating model, at least according to uh, Charles Betts, who's from Forrester Research. So it's, it's the, the, the patterns, I mean, DDD, you can argue, is, is, should be part of your digital operating model tool, if you like, in or a way of working in that kind of way, of, that, that future way of thinking. So I think DDD and, and team topologies fit fit very well together. In fact, some of the some of the sections in the book were very inspired by um, conversations with uh, people in the DDD space, particularly people like uh, Nick Tune, who you'll be familiar with, I'm sure. A quick uh, a quick advert. There will soon be a free. You don't have to pay any money. Free. Um, PDF that we're working on, free download, which is using the team topologies patterns, but in a remote context. So we're, we're working on that at the moment, and it will be published by IT Revolution um, at some point soon. We're, we're basically trying to get that out as quickly as possible. So this sh it, we're doing that because we want to help as many organizations as possible to kind of get to grips with, to, to become familiar with remote ways of working. Uh, in this kind of pandemic uh, situation that we're in now. So have a look out for that. It's, we're not sure exactly what it'd be called, but it's something like Team Topologies Workbook for Remote Teams, something like that. Um, uh, and hopefully that, that, that'll give people a, a lot of kind of useful tips for, for team working. Okay. So what I want to talk about this evening is what I call independent service heuristics. Uh, sounds a bit of a fancy title, but basically it's a set of rules or set of uh, clues um, that I think, well, certainly some organizations that we've worked with have used to try and help them look for possible independent services. So possible domain boundaries, possible kind of bounded contexts, but without going all the way down into the kind of um, full on DDD uh, concepts and and, and kind of training and, and so on. So kind of a, a first step towards a kind of a DDD approach. Um, so these are really what we call rules of thumb, clues for identifying kind of candidate value streams and domain boundaries. And we do that by seeing if these things could be run as a separate software as a service or cloud product. And here's a really key aspect could they be run? We're not saying we are going to build a separate cloud product. We're saying kind of conceptually, would it even make sense to run it as a separate cloud product? And these um, the, the, the independent service heuristics live in a GitHub repository, which is here. So I'll just share that with you. Just make it a bit bigger so you can see. I'll just send a link in the chat. I'll send a link in the chat. Good idea. Uh, so the GitHub repo is independence yeah I, I did that so oh you've done it sorry you've done it already Great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um so it's just here and we've actually done it as a creative commons uh license here it's technically not source code it's just it's just marked down but so you know we're taking pull requests and and so on um and um you can see here there's there's this checklist at the bottom and we use this checklist here to uh to ask questions of potential sort of we, we don't use ddd terminology at this point in in our in our in organizations we're working with because typically these organizations are completely new to to um to ddd and, and, and are not familiar with it so we use sort of different terminology but we, we we talk about candidate services for example or or sometimes candidate domains um and 
So these are the, the current questions that we're asking, what we call heuristics, clues really. Clues is a simpler word. Um, and I'll run through these in some more detail in, in a minute. So I'm not going to read all these out now. Um, but the questions so far, when we've worked with our with our clients and, and in training contexts have, have been useful, there's been some useful discussions. But I'm kind of here today to, to kind of ask for some challenge, ask for some criticism or feedback on the whole approach and specifically on these questions. Before we do that, I want to share with you some real world examples, real situations where we've used these independent service heuristics and then look at the kind of results that, that came out, just to give you a flavor of the kind of things that, um, that can help, uh, how, how, this, how this has helped. So the first situation was um, a mortgage provider in the Netherlands um, and when we ran, um, when we used the independent service heuristics in this particular organization, um, there was a really good discussion and, uh, this particular company, um, it, it does a lot of stuff to do with mortgages. Uh, so, uh, p personal mortgages in, in the Netherlands. One of the things they have to do is to mail out paper letters to people. And through the discussion, that was one candidate, potential candidate for as a separate service, because it had very different, um, very different kind of operational characteristics, because it's very physical. You have lots of printing and then putting into envelopes and things. The, everything around that, the people felt could be a separate, uh, could be a separate service. So with a separate team and a separate kind of domain model and that kind of thing. Um, they also had a customer portal where customers could log in and see progress of their mortgage or their mortgage application and this kind of thing. Um, they actually had a separate, an existing separate um, online brand. And obviously that was a pretty strong indicator that that could be a separate service because if it's already been running as, as a separate brand, then there's a lot of separation there already. Um, so that, that was kept as a candidate. Um, and there were a few other things as well about like a new, a new loan agreement um, and document storage and a few things like this. So you can see the, the whiteboard that, um, that we used on the right-hand side there. So that just gives you a bit of a flavor. So in the, in the, in the mortgage context, here are some things that, that came out of this discussion based on those independent service heuristics. Um, the second example I've got for you is for um, a pensions provider um, in the UK. And um, when we used these, an early version of these independent service heuristics, a few things came out as possible independent services. One is in the pensions terminology in the UK is called accumulation. And this is where you're paying into a pension. Um, and over time, the amount of money in the pension increases. So the amount that you hold, what's called a holding, kind of increases over time. So your pension pot, your, the amount in your pension is getting bigger. And that's kind of in their, in their world, that's one thing. And there's a separate thing, which in, in the UK is called decumulation, which is where basically you, you reach retirement age and you start to take money out of the pension and you take it as income. There were a few other things as well, but um, those were things that have been identified as, as potentially separate. They, they could be run as, as substantially independent uh, services with separate teams or separate groups of teams. And the final example comes from work I did with um, uh, a government. Uh, it's not the UK government, um, but a very large, um, a very large department dealing with uh, employment. And um, so, by the way, the, the images of the whiteboards are deliberately kind of blurred out here, just so we protect the protect the innocent, right? But you can see it's a real whiteboard because it's got my terrible handwriting on it. Um, it was a really interesting session we had with in this government department because we had people from across the whole um, 
let's call it the employment department, um, including people from um, HR, so human resources, um, and, uh, and and all kind of different people from from this department, as you'll see from from this list of p uh, candidate services that came out. So the first one was the HR. Um, spend a lot of time currently evaluating and classifying different jobs. And actually, if that could be turned into a service and done automatically, perhaps by using some text recognition and some AI and stuff like that, that would actually significantly improve, uh, significantly reduce the, the, the manual effort that they put into, uh, you know, creating new uh, job postings and, and, and reviewing CVs and this kind of thing. Um, they also identified a possible possibility of using of defining kind of um, some vulnerability scanning. So security scanning of containers and virtual machines and code and this kind of thing, kind of as a, as a service, the whole thing across multiple teams in, in the organization. Kind of that's like an internal service, I guess, not, not a customer facing thing. Um, a fairly common one, I guess, they also identify kind of infrastructure, cloud infrastructure as a service, uh, kind of self-service. So that's kind of at a platform Platform level, that's that's a fairly fairly common, fairly straightforward service, and a few other things as well. They've got a learning department, and they wanted to have people who had been on training courses get some real time feedback. It felt quite independent, um, and so on. And there's a few other different things as well. Anyway, so these are some real real world examples of where we've used that checklist, those heuristics, uh, to try and get people thinking about where sensible boundaries could be. So at what stage do you evaluate such a checklist? When is it a good time, you know, to go through, through this list and decide, okay, we need to separate service here? Good question. So th this was in the context of, um, this was in the context of looking at how teams could be rearranged to help with a faster flow of change. Okay. So we're trying to, so if we're trying to get a fast flow of change, we're trying to avoid handoffs between multiple teams. We're trying to get a single team responsible for an end to end delivery of a, of a service or product. Mm -hmm. So obviously in a kind of DDD context, we're talking about kind of bounded context and, and this kind of thing where we're trying to, we're trying to find these seams in the, in the, in different domain models or identify multiple different domain models and, and keep teams separate. Um, but as I said before, we don't use all of the DDD terminology, but we're we're heading in that direction effectively. This this was a sort of an early, the first step towards trying to get organizations to to look in a more DDD direction, start to think about, you know, what things are logically separate, what things do not actually need to talk to each other, what things do, don't, what things are have a very different, um, you know, set of vocabulary. So it start it starts to head in a it starts to point face in a kind of DDD direction basically. Right, thank you. So I thought I'd take you take everyone on a bit of a deep dive into this into this list of the current heuristics or or, or um, uh, clues, if you like, uh, that we use. Um, just to give you some additional context. So the first heuristic is, could it make any logical sense to offer this thing as a service? Because some things you can't offer as a service. They're, 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 they're more intertwined. They're, they're not separate. So, you know, thinking about this, whatever this thing is, is it independent enough? Would the consumers of that service even understand or value it as a separate service? Um, would it simplify? Would it simplify execution of something? Because if it if it doesn't simplify execution, we've probably got the service boundary wrong. So that's that's uh, heuristic number one. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I, can I pose you here? So there was a question from Eduardo earlier. Why do you explicitly state cloud-based service or product? Couldn't this be applied to other types of services? So why do we, let me just go back to, into here. It, it, for, so I think this is question two, branded as a public cloud service. I think it's, right. so okay. it, it doesn't have to be a public cloud service. It's just 
th there's lots of stuff which is easier to work with if it is public cloud because all the infrastructure is taken care of basically and it's it's kind of it's it's very straightforward to launch uh, a new uh, kind of conceptually there's lots of tools to help us launch a brand new cloud service for in a, in a relatively straightforward way and we can reach you know, millions of customers so a lot of the effort that in traditionally would have gone into marketing and all sorts of stuff now um we've got a potentially quicker path to getting to a point where we have an online cloud-based service rather than having to build our own data centers and all that kind of stuff. So th this, this is just about, um, um, it, it, the, the, the cloud aspect is not the important thing here. That's just an example. Um, we're, I guess we're, we're familiar, we're familiar with lots and lots of kind of cloud, cloud brands, if you like which um, kind of present themselves um, and are easy to compare and contrast. You know, apps in the App Store, you know, lots of different websites, this kind of thing. So it's kind of, um, it, the clown aspect is, is a bit of a distraction. It's just a shortcut towards, here's something which has, which does exist as a separate service and is easy to consume. All right. We also had a couple more comments uh, on the chat, so maybe you can go through them now. So Rebecca said that domains and separation of concerns are a good way to talk about a uh, good way to talk about regardless of whether people know DDD concepts or not. So plus one from me, definitely. We don't we don't need to you know introduce people to all, all the possible concepts to to be able to talk about the this ter like this these terms. And also, Christina said that what you said about the vocabulary, right? And that that's our ubiquitous language, and that's what Christina is highlighting. And the question from Rebecca is that how many of these checklist items uh, have to be ticked off to consider separating into a, into a service? It's a really good question. Uh, thanks, Rebecca. Um, so, uh, it, I guess most of them. It, the, the the more of the things that, that, that we can say yes to the more confidence we have. Like, this is really about a kind of a, a confidence measure. So if we've only, if we've only, if we can only answer yes to two of these, then we're probably not very confident. If we can answer yes to all seven, then our, then we're going to be pretty confident. We're going to be really quite confident that we've found something which is at least worth exploring a bit more. Right. I'll, I'll just take you back, actually. Let me just take you back a couple of slides um, because I think in this... With the cons with the consumer mortgages in the Netherlands, I think maybe you can see on the photograph on the right hand side. We we literally did that on the white on the on the on the paper pad on the right hand side, so that you can possibly just see some some ticks some checks next to uh, numbers one two three four five six seven. So that's that's me at the at the whiteboard kind of ticking off when we think we've. Um, got an, a, a positive answer to to each one of those seven items. So you'll see there that you know often, certainly for the three um, services that we've identified there, most of them, most of those seven questions have got a tick against them. So we were pretty confident, basically, with for, certainly for those three, that they were good candidates for for separate services. So there was I I, yeah. I have a. Yeah, so I have a question now that you, you are talking about heuristics. Now, Rebecca's here, so she might correct me a bit. Uh, for me, a heuristic is something that you can take immediate action on. So uh, what, what's your definition of heuristic here uh, in this case? So for me, a heuristic would be um, when, when is something an independent surface boundary? Uh, so that would be the question, and then the answer would be, well, if you can go to the heuristics, so I have them here as well. That's how I usually build them up, but maybe... So I think the, the heuristics here are are clues f to tell us whether something is a separate service, whether, whether it's an independent service. Mm -hmm. So it's independent service heuristics is heuristics that tell us whether something is an, an independent service. Yeah, so you, you would the question would be, when is something an independent service? And you would say, well... Uh, if it is, uh, if it makes logical sense to offer this thing as a service, it might become an independent service. So that's how you would state them. That's I'm kind of stating. And I, I suppose if we get, if we, if we've got a yes or, or a check mark against all seven, or all of the, yeah, all of, of the, or, or the majority yeah. of the criteria, then, then that's telling us 
this is probably an independent service. And it's worth us yeah. investigating a bit more or investing more time in really pushing that and seeing, is it truly independent? And and this feels like something we could actually kind of um, detach from other aspects of, of what's being built in the rest of the organization. Um, it's, it's to try and give us, try and give us some... Um, I guess early feedback or in early confidence. Uh, yeah, of about course. Where, where where we should invest our efforts, basically. Because it's still too complex, right? Uh, to really know. So. So we have three more questions. Uh, one of them is how domains in how domain services can be aligned with revenue streams in practice. Will it? Will it not be often the case that revenue stream is generated from many services playing together? Uh, true. Yeah. So this again, this is these are just some clues, if you like. So I mean, certainly, I, th I think the, the inverse is is possible too. Let me just go back to the questions. Um, sure. So that's Christian. So thanks for that, Christian. It's a good question. Um, let me just find out where that question is because i can't remember off the top of my head here we go uh revenue so it's question three isn't it um so if if something if something could be a separate revenue stream then i think that probably indicates that it is a good candidate to be separate but the, the inverse is, is not true as you identify because you might actually need multiple different kind of services or teams in order to have a viable revenue stream so it's not it's not that there's a one-to-one -one mapping, but but if something does have a separate revenue stream, or it, you could imagine how the revenue stream would work, then that could be an independent service because it might be small enough, if you like, to to um, to work with. It, it, so I, I like the question. It, it's it's um, it, it's, yeah, it, it shows that kind of insight. Now. Yeah. So so. About the revenue that that popped into my mind, the the, the bounded context canvas from this uh, guy, Nick, right? Well, he he is talking about um, revenue, and I myself now I'm in the regulatory side of uh, a company. So would you say you you could only do this uh, because you're saying here could this thing be managed a viable cloud service in terms of revenue and customers? So I don't have that. Would that make it less viable for that for this pattern? If I can make maybe a sort of pattern it is for an independent service thing, would you say? Would would it be only be used for revenue uh, services or um that's a good question. So I think as it stands, um so this 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 is a good example of of why I'm I'm keen to get this kind of feedback basically because 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 um, this at the moment uh, might might um, these questions as they currently stand might miss or omit or or, or 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 go around some kind of services which. Which, which is unfortunate because because then we, we'd miss them out and we, we we'd miss the opportunity to identify those as separate things. So um, it, it's it's the current list of questions. We might add some more questions. It'd be great if I get some pull requests back after the after the session and we've got some nice additional questions that we can put in or even some alternatives. So you might say, well, actually, sometimes you could replace question three with question with a different version of question three, which is a bit more focused. For example. Right, so we also had Christina uh, saying that uh, software as a service product is much, 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 much more than a service up and running for her. Uh, an element, uh, elementary part would be if it's sellable, would somebody pay for it? And that most companies have only one of, of them of the type of a service. So her question is whether uh, this heuristic doesn't lead to a very rough filter that it's a hard pass, hard no. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it is a it, that's a it's a really um, it, it's a it's a very um, it, it's it's a very early way of trying to get organisations to think about independent services because lots of organisations that I go into have 
very tightly kind of coupled teams working on all sorts of things. Um, yeah. Not a clear understanding of what where the individual where the different value comes from, and so some of these questions are very almost brutal, if you like, as, as you said, uh, Christina, very rough, and so it's just a starting point to try and um, chop some of these out. So may, maybe maybe um, maybe one way of of evolving this list is to have kind of multiple stages, so we could have a kind of rough set of questions that, are, that we start with, and perhaps then depending on the kind of service it is, but there might be some that are uh, additional questions that, are, that relate to things that are more revenue generating, additional questions that relate to things that are more like government services, something that's not revenue generating, something like this. Um, maybe we need a flowchart. <laughs> well, maybe, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and so that that's always uh, I'm not sure if I go into this heuristics, but I'm in a regulatory where you have a lot of custom off the shelf, right? I'm trying out team topology there, uh, but we'll have two teams on one surface. Mm -hmm. um, how how maybe this is not related to this topic, but. I'm struggling there myself a bit. So how would you split these teams up in forms of team topology? And would this help if I will use this checklist? Right. So um, I'm having a monolith or a custom off the shelf. It doesn't actually matter if it's a monolith. Of, it's not easily breaking up to be broken up. But still, I have 20 people or 15, 20 people working on it. So two teams. Uh, so that might this help? It might be a question for another time but um, or for later on. But um, so this, this, these questions are not designed at this point to uh, find team-sized services. They're just, they're just designed to find things that, are, that could be separated. Because basically, we've got a big ball of spaghetti, and we need to just kind of separate it out into, into a few different strands to start with. So I think that actually that relates to Christina's question as well. It's a bit rough. It's at the moment that these are kind of the very first, the very first pass, if you like, the very first way through all of this big spaghetti mess to try and look for things that are a bit separate. But you still might end up with, um, you know, if we look at question two and we have something that we can brand as avocadoonline.com, that still might be huge. It's just not as big as the big monolithic spaghetti mess that was there before. So it doesn't. The short answer is it doesn't directly talk speak to team size services yet in terms of these current questions. Cool. Right. We've had about 10 more questions on the chat, <laughs> and we have we have two people that want to talk. So uh, if that's okay, I, I'm going to let Robert ask his question now or wait, uh, express his opinion. So Robert, you are on call now. Should be uh, he should be able to he should rejoin now and uh, allow to talk. Can you hear us, Robert? I think something's up there. If not, we have us another person, and Robert, you can see what's happening in the meantime. Oh. All right. I'll ask uh, Jay Costa then. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hello. Yes. Hello. Good afternoon. Um, so I think, uh, uh, considering the the previous question, uh, the thing is, in a in an organization, many times uh, people get uh, SaaS products to solve some issue, right? And uh, the question here is, uh, if you already uh, bought an uh, out of the shell product, right? And you want to make customizations, you will always have limitations, right? Uh, but if you already go through that path, you're already uh, like uh, saying, you're already deciding that uh, you have a, a thing that says it's a value stream. That's why you bought out of the shell to solve uh, an issue from your organization. Um, what do you guys think? Does this uh, make sense? Um, so, I think people may have been got may be confused by the idea of this uh, of cloud product or SaaS product. We're not. I'm not suggesting that 
that we're, we're, we're definitely not advising the organization to go and create a separate product. This is just kind of conceptually. Um, is, it, is it even possible to think of a service as being run as a separate cloud or, or SaaS hosted product? It, would it even make any sense to do that? Would it make any logical sense or any business sense or any any kind of sense to kind of run something as a separate as a separate service? Exactly, exactly. Uh, I, I understand that part. I okay. mean, when an organization already uh, took the step to buy, to buy something out of the shelf, you already gave that step in some domain. Uh, it's what I'm saying. Uh, but uh, I think uh, what you're saying in the, on, on the other uh, things that she's still deciding if it's uh, a, a service, the kind of service could be uh, could be uh, satisfied by a, like a SaaS product. Uh, I think these heuristics are for those services that already are not yet uh, uh, satisfied by some SaaS product. Uh, I said she's something what's going to be built. It's not present yet. So yes, exactly. So, exactly. So, so you're saying that if if the organization was really um, was quite uh, forward thinking and uh, happy with consuming SaaS products for, for, for its peripheral, um, for, for the non-core aspects, then, then these heuristics would only find the bits that it could push out to the cloud. Is that, is that what you're saying? Uh, yes, I, I, just, I, I, just, uh, I was just trying to understand the previous uh, uh, feedback, mm -hmm. because what I understand from these heuristics is uh, giving the things you are uh, you have in your organization. You think, okay, this I have this in my core, right? And uh, I and I want to be and I want to have more flow. And if I want to have more flow, let me see this that I'm uh, this code or this uh, services that I have in house. If I could uh, uh, make it as a software as a service, maybe it's a good candidate to make a team or something, uh, a value stream for that because it is uh, isolated for somehow and it can yep. uh, uh, reply to one of these seven uh, points that you put here. Yep. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Gonna put you on mute again. Thank you. So there's a question from Nick. I wonder if these heuristics behave differently with generic supporting core domains. I have no answer to that yet. Um, that's a really great question and well, a really great wondering. Um, I, I, would, I would love to kind of explore that. I, I, I don't know. And I, I'm sure you know the heuristics as they. I know the heuristics as I currently stand here could be expanded. We've talked about that already, and so maybe they would need to ex be expanded or even differentiated for generic supporting core. I don't know. So that's 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 a, 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 a would be a great to get some feedback around that. Right, we have a lot of questions and comments. Matthew, do you want to go in for these questions, or do you want to you know uh, go through your list first? So I think what we could do is just go through a few more things just for me to kind of expand on the on the seven questions first. And that might then answer some questions. I'm not sure. Um, All right. I'll keep track of them and make sure I have a copy of them somewhere. So, you know. Yep. Uh, so we've better. seen we've seen number one. So we've gone through this. Um, would, would the consumers of the service understand or value it? Would it simplify execution in some way? So that, that's, you know. Because if service is not, if the execution of something is not simplified, what's the value out of, the, of, of having a service around it? Um, we've talked a little bit about this already. Could something even be branded as some kind of online service? Um, because that normally speaks to the offering being compelling. It normally speaks to a kind of differentiated user base, this kind of thing. Um, it's not to say, as I said, we're not saying you will go and run this as a separate brand, but it's it might give a clue that it's nice and separate conceptually. Um, 
So could this thing, could this this concept or this, this area be managed as a viable cloud service in terms of revenue and customers? So if you had a subscription model for this, subscription payments, what would that include? Could you work out roughly what, what, that, what someone would pay for? Um, and is there a kind of clearly defined customer base or segment? Because that speaks to you know, clear user personas. It speaks to well-identified user needs and so on. Um, question four was, could the organization currently track costs and investment in this thing separately from similar things? Certainly what I find in lots of organizations that are struggling with software delivery is they do not actually understand where revenue comes from or where money is being spent because they haven't taken the time to kind of track the spend or costs properly. They might have, they might spend money on a project and then when that project goes live, it just, the costs are, 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 are taken by the operations team. And so you, you, there's this big disconnect between the real costs of running a service, which is why I'm asking these questions here. So is this thing we're talking about too interconnected or is it fairly separate? And does the organization even have ways of tracking the cost of this thing separately from, from a lot of other things? Um, question five was, could this thing operate with minimal data from other sources? So if something is dependent on lots of data from multiple sources, it gets more difficult. Obviously, that's kind of that's this kind of interdependency at a data level. If actually it, it can operate somewhat separately, or if it needs only like one data source or a couple of data sources, then arguably it's yeah. I mean, by definition, it's a bit more separate. And are the data sources internal? Are they inside our organization, or are they external? Because if the data sources are under our control. It's easy for us. It's easier for us to um, to arrange how that data enters the, the the service. Number six was: Could this thing have a small, well-defined set of user types or customers? Um, so, you know, is it meeting well-defined user needs? If it isn't, is it going to be successful as a separate service? You know, maybe not. That, that's a that's a fairly um, uh, a fairly good question to ask to, for, for, to keep ourselves honest. And you know, can do we know what these user needs are and the users, or could we actually easily find out what their needs are? Um, and then question seven, which is the, the the final question out of the seven that I currently have in in this set. Could a team or set of teams effectively build and operate a service based on this thing? So would the cognitive load be too high on a team or a set of teams to run this thing? Would they need some, would they need like a load of infrastructure to help them run it? Is that infrastructure commodity or is it really bespoke? Is it really difficult and expensive to buy? Um, you know, is it even realistic for them to, to take on something like this? Um, so that that's that's a kind of a deeper dive into those questions. We've already we've already actually gone into into some of the detail there. I'm really looking for gaps. I'm looking for gaps like this. Is there is there is there any danger in using these kind of questions as a first step towards a kind of DDD mindset? Um, because diving in straight diving straight in with DDD in some of these organisations is is too much. So that's why that's why we came up with this this set of questions, independent service heuristics. And so, as as you'll have seen in the in the in the chat and conversation we've just had, questions, we're we're, we're looking for where this approach might not work, what the pitfalls might be, and if there are kind of questions or ideas missing. Right, I think there's a lot of questions on the chat. Uh, shall we go through them now? Okay, so we finished on the question about generic supporting core domains. The next one is, can I check where that's from Wazim? Can I check where the consideration for the size of the service and the teams need to maintain it, needed to maintain it? The point seven says a team or a set of teams managing it. As soon as we talk about more than one team, how will we sustain fast flow? 
So that is a really good question. And uh, Wazim, you're going to um, either either laugh or maybe hate me, but uh, have a look at this book, which I happen to be the co-author of. Uh, that's exactly the kind of question that we're that, the questions that we're that we're addressing in the book. Is as soon as you have more than one team, what's the relationship between multiple teams? What's the kind of interactions and the responsibilities and the types of team and so on? Um, so that we, we we deal with with um, that with more than one team, how do you sustain fast flow? There's a lot of material in in the team topologies book. So so you know what's uh, annoying about remote sessions. So I have the book here, <laughs> and this one is a unedited advanced reader copy, already signed by Manuel, but not by you. Uh -huh. I can't sign it. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's horrible. <laughs> Sorry for that uh, intermesso. <laughs> that's all right. When I see you, I'll sign it. <laughs> that's a downside. <laughs> right. Next question from Christian. Uh, maybe one could say that if the service by itself can can give a tangible product of use for some customer user then it is a good candidate okay i so i think that that's a paraphrase of uh, yeah exactly which is which is why i put this, this kind of question 6 in there maybe the question is not is not worded quite well and i, I think uh, christian i like your your phrasing there this kind of tangible use to to some customer or consumer and that's what i'm trying to get at with this and, and uh, that's that's what I felt. If there's some tangible value for for one kind of customer type, it feels like it's could be a, a useful service boundary. Right. So, so I, I pre sorry. yeah. So yeah, there's a question on YouTube where some where Zumo players is looking at these questions. It looks like we are looking if services or group of them can be successful startup without focusing on earning aspects. Question mark. Uh, so that could be one way to look at it. I think we did have a, I think one of the questions is around a viability of the revenue stream though, isn't it? I think, uh, where is it? Um, uh, question three mentioned viable revenue. So that's the money part there. Um, but certainly, yeah, I mean, you, you, these could be applied to, to looking at the organization's existing uh, software and uh, kind of services and things and, and uh, looking to see if it's possible to break off a small startup, that would be that would be one possible outcome. I mean, that might be one outcome of running this exercise anyway. It might be one outcome of running some kind of DDD um, mapping exercise or something. You might end up saying, well, actually, this thing is substantially separate. It's nothing to do with the rest of our business. Let's actually spin it off as a startup. That, that's a reasonable outcome of, of of a conversation in this kind of space but we're not we're not with these questions we're definitely not assuming uh, and we're not we do not recommend to our customers you you must go and create a new startup that's not, that's not what we're trying to do here we're just we're using these questions as a kind of thought experiment to try and to try and get a feel for how independent they are but if if later on that organization decides to create a startup and, and a completely separate service product. That's great. I think that's kind of related. So heuristic proposal from Nick, would investors fund it as a separate product, even if we don't know how to manage it yet? That's a nice way of looking at it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, so then... We have a comment from Rebecca. Maybe it should be a set of close related teams. I think that was a comment to what we were discussing at the time. So that could be questions, a, a slightly a better wording for question seven, I think, from Rebecca, which is could a, could a team or a closely related set of teams effectively build an operator service? So that's a nice, that's a nice refinement of question seven. I like that. Thank you. Okay. And the comment question from Tim. Uh, whether something or not has a revenue stream can very much depend on company vision and focus. For sure. And an extension to that, most of AWS services were just eternal before they decided it was a profitable business in itself to sell them externally. Yep. That's that's the story of AWS in general, right? It is a story. So, Tim, that's a really good question. Uh, but I think what we can do, 
because because everyone in the kind of software space pretty much now knows about AWS and knows about that strategy of of, of turning the internal stuff and and, and and make it available externally, and that's been going on since you know at, at least two thousand and two, and it was probably happening before that. Um, because we know about that as a pattern and an innovation pattern, then we can take the intent of that innovation pattern and apply it in our context as well. So we know that um, you know that's inherent to how Amazon operates. Yes, it's an internal service, but they're they're always thinking at some point this might have to be external, and and that's how all the inter that's how all the AWS services are built. They're built to be externalizable. So we, we can use the same um, kind of design principles, if you like, that AWS have used successfully for ages and apply them internally here. It's, it's a nice, a nice observation. Right. So next question from Leon. And it, is the question, could it be viewed as a, as a revenue stream like AWS services? That's right. Okay, and the three indicators work with the software as a service example. Is it disconnected or discrete? Does it have an inherent isolated value stream? Will it simplify things? Uh, anything to add, Matthew? So these are, you have to forgive me because this, this might be obvious to, to most people on the call, but these are, these are three indicators that are standard within DDD. Is that right? Uh, no, I don't think they are standard okay. within DDD. Uh, I think that's that's how Ben summarizes. Ben, do you want to maybe join the call, explain a little bit more, or write a bit extra on the chat? I mean, just just looking at those three things there. So, is it disconnected or discrete? Does it have an inherent or isolated value stream, and will it simplify things? I mean, they're they're great. They're great. Um, yeah, as, as Ben says, indicators or, or kind of uh, questions to 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 ask ourselves to to kind of qualify or identify whether something is a candidate for being independent. Okay, so we had Rebecca being excited about heuristics, and then <laughs> following up on Kenny's remark on point three, could this be stated more as could generate revenue value independently and have a clear customer. Yep. That could make could. this point heuristic more clear. So just how to clarify the question. No, I like thanks good. Eduardo. That's 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 nice. Okay. What next? So Tim, Tim's point here about um, mm -hmm. so being able to imagine something as a revenue stream is is good, but it's only a clue because a service can be useful to a business without being a viable business in its own right. So this this is clearly true. Um, it, it's that's why these are kind of the, that's why these are clues and not absolute um, black and white yes or no. Um, it's, it's the it's the old, it's the collection of answers to to a set of questions like this, which will give us a degree of confidence that we're heading in the right direction. Yeah, and and to to relate on that because uh, uh, to give this clue, could this thing be managed as a viable cloud service in terms of revenue and customer? On the other hand, there might be a competing heuristic here that says, well, sometimes I want to. Uh, especially in maybe a supportive or generic domain in this case, I actually want to not make it a, a, in terms of revenue and customer. Um, but I, there, there you're in the spectrum to, if you make everything more revenue, then you're probably also making things more um, towards a profit. So separating stuff more, which might actually be good. And I'm brain storming here, right? I, I don't know myself, but I was more thinking like sometimes companies want to combine things together more as a more cohesive unit uh, to make it as a service, but not for a profitable sense, but for a supportive sense where you say, well, this looks the same and maybe we should combine it. So especially I'm thinking regulatory here, right? Because I'm now for the regulatory yeah. where everything is more about cost saving and revenue 
because they just need to they need to be regulated and so there is a competing one here mm. i guess where you as on one hand yes revenue but on the other hand hmm, it, I, i'm i'm not there yet but yeah, there's yeah. something competing here yep no no it's, it's a bigger point um the two things there the first one revenue versus um on the revenue point revenue is a very blunt instrument like a big hammer to, yeah, to, use, to, to, to use in the in this space the, yeah, the, so definitely. something something a bit more uh, refined and a bit more general actually is just cost tracking or, or or expenditure tracking because that doesn't need to be about revenue that's just we're tracking how much this thing costs um across all aspects of, of running this thing. That includes infrastructure, includes planning, it includes your writing code, it includes, it includes customer support, the whole lot to doing that thing. And whether or not that, that thing is generating any revenue, it still has a cost associated with it. So for example, government services. Government services, generally speaking, are not revenue generating, but they do have a cost associated with them. So we need to track that all the way down. So the word revenue here is, is this big, massive hammer and actually, maybe I could change yeah. the, the terminology to say, actually, we're, we're really talking about tracking costs across every dimension of, of that, providing that service. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So Rebecca expanded on her previous comment. So the, she was saying that the thing she was getting at was that if you need a, a different set of questions for different kind of services, maybe you need a decision tree and not just you know one set of clues. So... And then, yeah, she was wondering whether there are different types of services that they, they, that they have different questions to ask about. So that it, was... it, it, to, to, to comment on that, it's been something I've also experimented with and sometimes with Rebecca to have, you start with a bigger question and then you get it sort of like a tree downstairs in a heuristic map, right? So you start with one question and then it's a, maybe a yes or no. It relates to another question. And yeah, it's a decision mm -hmm. tree but with all sorts of heuristic in it. Uh, I'm actually experimenting that as a workshop format, uh, uh, which I discussed with Rebecca. And I actually like it that way. And I've done such a session at Kandinsky and I've done it with Rebecca, mm. which, yeah, make it more so, yeah, that way. Nice, no, I like that. And, and we're hey. trying to explore this also on DDD heuristics, right? Where can we have these uh, flows of questions, like a sort of uh, checklist as well, what you say. Yep. If it's <laughs> possible. Okay, so I'm going back to the top of, of the list. So the question from Leek was, do we have a good example of potential service that wouldn't meet criteria that we definitely wouldn't consider it as a separate software as a service product? And the example from Christina was self sign up. So I think that's that's about whether we would consider it being something a separate service, like a cloud offering, if it's even a you know a viable thought to have. Okay. I'm just trying, and, and, just trying yeah. to understand Nick's, Nick's question. Um, so is there a potential service that... So oh, is see, there an I, example of a service that, yeah. that wouldn't, yeah, wouldn't be viable to run as a service? So, so effectively what you're saying, Nick, is, is are, there, are there questions here that would... Are there questions missing which would actually still end up identifying a, a useful independent service but we don't have those questions on this list yet. And so these questions would only find a certain subset of candidate services. And there might be another set of candidate services, which we would identify with some other questions, which we don't have in the list yet. I think, I think is what you're saying. So he added a comment at the end. Nick, you can join by the way. I'm thinking about excluding options rather than including options. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I think that would answer the question with a no. Okay, scroll it up, up again. There's a nice one here from uh, Wazim at 7.11 p.m. Okay. Um, 
an obvious heuristic. Can you see this thing being needed by more than one other application or service? Thank or you. I was, I, I was scrolling all the way up, and but I'm in a different time zone. Hey. 7-Eleven. Hey, I got time zone again. Yeah, hey. it, it could be 8-11 p.m. for you, maybe, Kenny. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, could this thing? Could you see this thing being needed by more than one other application service? So that's an interesting one, isn't it? And because the the danger. So I, I, I like it to up to a point, but the the danger with that kind of um, approach is that we we might end up falling into the into the trap of of, of lots of organizations in the past where they went ahead and created a platform of lots and lots and lots of you know shared services which then didn't really meet any strong user or or any other need in the organization or they they half they half that they, they went halfway to meeting a need because there's always a possibility that something might be reused by something else but um I don't know what what do other people think. It, it feels like it might lead you down a route where you just end up creating like hundreds of services because this thing might get used by something else at some point in the future, rather than having a much more concrete customer or user driven approach to to creating that as a separate as a separate thing. It, it feels like it's good and bad, basically. So I mean, it's, it's a good question, Rosine, but I think it in in some organisations. That kind that question might lead them down a path of creating far too many separate services, which then become very difficult to run. So Wasim is saying that he agrees with your concern. I was assuming the other services already meet your checklist items. Mm. So it's, it's an interesting one that we might actually kind of include as a as a maybe there's opportunity in in this independent service heuristics to to include some maybe some anti questions or some questions which which. Um, we should be, uh, be be cautious with perhaps, and that that could, that could that could be one there. That's quite a nice one. So I think that was also discussed later by Nick and Rebecca were they were saying about the yes and no questions, and the questions here. Yeah. Mm. Uh, okay, so Christina gave an example going back to the self sign up that it's a supporting service that uh, in itself doesn't have any value about the rest really. So it could could be you know a separate service for our organization, but on its own, it's really useless. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there was again comment about value streams that are strongly aligned with customer journeys. Core can the orchestration of a software as a service services, not just unique di differentiation. Let me reread that. I'm not hundred percent sure. Is, is, this it, is, is it supposed to say the core can be the orchestration of SaaS services, not just the unique differentiation? Would that make sense? Okay. Uh, Sa Salish, can you please expand on that? And we'll, we'll get back to it. Okay. Uh, next one. Oh, there is a comment. Oh, there is a comment from Christina saying that she saw products doing nothing else but orchestrating. Fair enough. Okay. So I yeah. also have the feeling here um, where you say this is DDD light and, and get you into the first discovery. And all of these questions, I think, can go more deeply into the real DDD context, right? Where, uh, so for instance, I saw products doing nothing else but orchestrate orchestrating that for me would be uh, yeah a wrongly picked boundary maybe but i'm not sure if 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 but maybe you can you can relate on that matthew because you call it ddd light when do we need to go from this to maybe more into that ddd well it's, that, it's, that's it's, now popping in my mind yeah no exactly exactly i mean it's, it's, it popped in my mind as well and and i'm i'm still exploring yeah I'm still exploring that journey, if you like, because we, we've the questions as they exist, and maybe a slightly expanded version of the questions that clearly have been useful to, to some organisations. But that is just the sort of first step. How how we bridge from that into 
you know, into the, the proper DDD world, I'm still exploring that. And so if, if people have got ideas, that'd be great. Um, clearly needs to, um, I mean, I'd definitely be interested to hear from people if they think it's actually taking us away from DDD, if it's, if it's heading in a different direction, because that would be worrying for me because I wouldn't want to do that. Um, and that's why I was saying, you know, tell me about the gotchas, tell me about the broken bridges um, that would actually prevent an organization from getting getting across into, into kind of DDD world by starting off with uh, with these with these uh, heuristics. I have a question, like from your perspective, why is it hard for organizations to get into DDD? What, what, what's so hard about it? And I understand it's, you know, it's a very broad topic, but maybe if we, if we can define what, what is hard about it, maybe we can simplify these things. What's hard, I think, is that lots of organizations don't really understand how their business works. Okay. Which, when I realized that, it was slightly frightening because these, these businesses are there, kind of organizations just there doing stuff and they're getting money from somewhere and they're, and they're employing loads of people. And actually, no one knows how, what's happening, really. It's just bizarre. Um, but if you, if you look at, the, if you look at what's the dynamics and what's happening and the way which uh, decisions are made and the way which things are communicated, there is a real lack of clarity in lots of organizations about where the revenue comes from or how much things cost or the relative importance of different uh, streams of work. And that ends up getting reflected in the software in the, in the sense of it's a kind of big monolith or big ball of mud or whatever. Um, so I think the real challenge is that actually in lots of organizations, there is either an accidental or deliberate lack of clarity about um, kind of different flows of value. And, that, and that's where the challenge is. In some, in some organizations, there's actually pushback because the people who are in charge don't want there to be clarity because then they'd, they'd have more responsibility. They'd be accountable for the full end-to-end -end cost of running that service, and they don't want that. <laughs> they just want to say, here's a new thing. Go, go, and, go and do this project, and then I'll, I'll take the credit for it, and someone else can take the costs. Um, that's a bit cynical, but that's, that's, what, <laughs> that's what I see. Nick so this called is it Game of Thrones architecture. Okay. Well, I, 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 so I had this discussion with Nick to relate on that. I have another one there, which is called the bold and the beautiful architecture. So uh, relating to the book Accelerate, you have these three types of cultures. You have the psychopathic culture. I think, what was the name again of that culture model? West? No, I don't know. So you have the psych psychopathic, which is the Game of Thrones. But you also have the bureaucratic, which I call the bold and the beautiful uh, culture where you have your families protecting each other right it's, but not killing each other so <laughs> th there's a bit of a difference pathological yeah thank you it's pathological it's westrom isn't it who, who does those westrom, yes, yeah. thanks that's the model yeah so there you have uh, several uh, yeah settings Yep. Right. We have 25 minutes worth of questions on the chat. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. so that's good. That's good. Uh, so going back to the question from Christina at 16, pa 16 past 7 or 8, depending on the time zone. Uh, so that's related to question number five. If one data source is a five terabyte, I assume Oracle could lead to, to the wrong answer, I think. I would change it to can have single ownership of its data. Yes, so the number of data sources. Yes. Is it... Yeah, no, that's nice. That's a, that's, a, that's a good insight. That's good insight. Mm -hmm. Yep. I think that's actually a quite good one where we say, right, each, especially when you go to the microservices or if people like to have their uh, mat in microservices, whatever, uh, they say services need to have their own database. So actually, that's a pretty good one. Okay, uh, comment regarding gaps from Christian. Uh, often most service boundaries are obvious for, for those start to establish rather than diving deep into the heuristics, maybe also keep in mind the heuristic about special vocabulary. The user's name concepts differently in this service, in this service candidate. Yeah, that's a nice one, I like that. So have we got different names for things in this area compared to another area? Um, yeah, I like that. Dif so that's effectively diff is does different vocabulary exist in this area compared to another one? That's a nice one. 
Okay. So that, that this this uh, reminds me also as that um, Alberto wrote this blog post about customer journey as a bounded. No, no, it was the context mapping on a business grid. Have you seen that? Where he talks about you have um, you have several business streams, but you also have business faces. Is that something you you've seen before? So, for instance. Uh, you can. Uh, I'm in regulatory, so I'll have different uh, different phases of reporting, but for different private banking or uh, public banking. So these are all business streams, but in the flow itself, it passes several phases. Have you? Is there something where? So so the question that was just asked reminded me of this. Have you ever seen that before? Yeah, I've seen some things like that, and it's a good point. This. The questions as they stand assume a kind of um, uh, a flow of change, I guess, that is relatively um, consistent and doesn't have changes over time as it as the questions stand now. So there could be something around. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what the question would be, but something about different phases. Um, yeah, so Alberto a, a, a has kind of, a, like a life cycle of change or something like that, isn't it? Yeah, so it's the the business phases he calls them, like you have strategy, design, planning, sales. In this case, it's collecting data or extract, transport, load, calculate, uh, report. Right, these are the phases. So the question would be, how would you make your surface boundary? Will will it be more on the phases or will it be more on the business lines? Mm. So maybe there's a question there. I'm not sure which one yet, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe someone in the chat ever seen that before. I mean, my my instinct would be on the business lines, but and uh, there will be times when when that's that that leads to um, that doesn't work because there's there's too much specialism needed for the different the activities in the different phases. So yeah, it's a good question. So Kenny, you mentioned heuristic mapping the chat as well. Do you want to expand on that? Um, what do you mean by this? So it actually, I've been talking for the last two, three years, I think, with Rebecca about heuristics. And I've been to her workshop finally this year and been to some hands-on. Last year, I run a hands-on at Kandinsky, where we first go into um, mapping. But at some point, and it's something that Rebecca does as well, you start with a question and you have like stickies. Right, I have one here. You start with one question on top. Maybe I can do it here. So you start with one question on top, and that will have two outcomes, right? Like this. And it, it would be a maybe a bit similar to what Wortley does in his value stream. Right? You go, you start somewhere on the top and then you move down with specific branches. And that's how I call it um, mapping. But Matthias also has his uh, as is free format heuristic mapping, but I do it more structured in, in that way. I'm still experimenting with it because I'm not sure how, but uh, yeah. All that sounds good. I mean, I, I'd, I'd love to I mean, learn more about this, learn more these, about these techniques and to link up, to link this stuff with things that other people are doing, um, like heuristic mapping or, or other structured techniques or unstructured te techniques. Um, Eventually, I'll have to learn how to do Wardley mapping as well. Everything seems to lead to Wardley mapping, which is, yeah. <laughs> which is funny. Well, it's also what Rebecca says, right? There are many ways to get at heuristics. Link Coffee is a good way to get her. there. There's much formats, but yeah. Um, yeah. when I'm in a group, I like to do the mapping version. But it's also nice to just the, the Link Coffee sitting and just write for yourself what you're listening or just ethnographic reading or there's several formats you can do. and. I think uh, Rebecca, that you wrote about it already, all of them, or no, I'll still answer later. <laughs> Some of them. Nick so. has Nick has got a very uh, topical comment, which is that you don't need to have all the symptoms to be diagnosed with coronavirus, and the same is true of heuristics like these. So you might only get five of the seven 
symptoms, if you like, symptoms of an independent service, but that still might be a good indicator that it's a separate service. We don't have to get seven ticks for seven questions or 17 ticks for 17 questions if that's what the, 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 the heuristics end up with. So there is a question from Eduardo. What would you do after the exercise of running these heuristics? I, th I think indeed this might give some indication, but I would not commit immediately. Maybe we can identify the idea services make no sense, but if it makes sense, should we go into a more depth the exercise? So is, is it like a first filter? It's a kind of it's a kind of first filter. It's also to get people thinking in the right way. To be honest, it's also a way to um, get people interested in DDD. Because what, one of the things I say at the end of this, uh, using this, is look, this is a very lightweight, a very kind of introductory way of thinking about kind of boundaries and domains and this kind of stuff. And actually, here's a book that was written in whenever it was, where was it, 2003? And it's got this nice light blue cover, and uh, there's various groups and people who are really kind of uh, experienced in, in this, in, in DDD, and, and, you know, you should get involved. And um, so, so that's, at the moment, that's, that's kind of a, a next step. Um, the, in in some, of the, some of the organizations that we've run this in, they have, they've taken... Uh, some of these candidate services that we, we've sort of identified and then explored that further and pushed pushed it effectively, pushed the, 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 the possibility that that is an independent service with, with separate teams and so on, and separate, as we've seen, separate data, separate, kind of separate, almost separate everything. And um, they've gone ahead and, and tried, to, tried to effectively falsify that hypothesis. They've, they've, they've gone ahead and said, uh, let's try and prove that this thing is not a separate service. Let's try and find reasons why this could not be separate and use that as a way to try and then, then push ahead with it. And if they can't find, if they, if they don't find any problems with, with that approach, then effectively then they've, they've split that thing off. And, it, and it's enabled them to have a fast flow of change in that area. And then, and then they'll, and then they'll do it. They'll, they'll do the same thing with the next candidate service. And over time, then they can work across, across a, um, a, a, a you know, an enterprise estate or an organizational estate of services and software. And over time, gain faster flow in these independent areas. There still might be a, a bit in the middle, which is monolithic and difficult, but they've, they've achieved some benefit by having, uh, having separation in, in, in multiple areas. So yes, it, it's a it's a first step in toward towards trying to to find and do something about these separate um, separate domain boundaries and business areas, basically. So, question from Tim. He says it's unrelated, but I think it's very much related. So, if you were to start helping in your organization, what level of domain discovery would you do before checking these heuristics? You hinted that. These are done re relatively early on, but I imagine they yeah. that they could be hard to answer from. What's the what's the what's the timestamp, Casper, on the question? Seven thirty-eight from Tim Mortimer. Seven thirty-eight. Okay. Um, uh, so, if you're starting to help a new organization, what level of domain discovery would you do before checking? The so, at the moment. Um, I wouldn't do any dis domain discovery because, like I said at the beginning, I'm I'm not an expert in DDD, so I don't feel that's partly why I'm coming here today to learn some stuff. Um, uh, I imagine that it would be a good thing, and at the very least, I imagine that it, uh, you might do that domain discovery uh, immediately after an exercise like this with the independent service heuristics. Um, you could either do, I, I guess, you, you're going to be doing these things close in time together because because they um i guess they're probably trying to do some similar things but yeah i i'm, I'm not i i don't feel um qualified if you like or have enough experience to kind of do to, to run proper um domain discovery uh, sessions yet um thank you so rebecca helped that uh, said that if i might help to to be a bridge mm. to get to, to this stage well, yeah. So that's that is so event summing specifically uh, in terms of like a like a two day or three day session with someone who knows how to run it is something that we've actually um, 
so we, we've we've run these independent service heuristics with some clients, and then we've introduced um, that client to um, someone in the DDD world who can do who can do event storming. And so that was that was the next step for for a few clients, not not all of them, but a few of them. So yeah, Rebecca, absolutely. Um, event storming seemed to be the right thing to do next for those clients. So that was really useful. But I suppose what I could, what I could actually do in the in the GitHub repository is identify that as a next step. I could probably add like next steps section to the to the um, the GitHub repository so that people have them understand what to do after running through these questions. That would be quite a nice a nice thing to do. Give people some some ideas. So. Um... It might actually, now that I think of this, uh, also work the other way around, where I sometimes go into a company and do a big picture event storming, but then it's hard for people to explain bounded contexts. And maybe, so Alberto has his heuristics out of a big picture context, how to define emergent bounded contexts. And maybe you need to go a bit deeper, I don't know. But uh, I've run it at a customer and then I'm trying now to map it to team topology, actually. And I, I, I think I've sent Nick a first draft of that picture. Uh, but it's actually, I think it's the other way around. It would work as well, starting with the big picture and then dive in and then use this independent mm -hmm. checklist. That, that would really help me, I think. All right. So there's a question from Hamad. Uh, have you found any limitations of DDD as yet? That's quite generic or a broad question. Um, right? So that's not really a question for me because I I, yeah. I, I don't consider myself a, a, any any really qualified to say much about DDD. It's a question for other people. I'd love to know the answer to that. <laughs> if, if anyone else can can be really honest about any limitations of DDD as as it as it's currently practiced. I think. One of the things is that the entry barrier is quite high. It's quite hard to get into. And there is a lot of like, you know, knowledge and experts in the community and so on, but it's not as easy to get into and people are arguing and not everything is clear. So that's, these are some of the things that, for example, Nick is trying to, you know, make simpler for people to get into. So maybe that's not the limitation of the DDD itself, but that's like what stops people from getting into it from my perspective. Yeah. I mean, that's that's partly why I wanted to, to run. Well, it's great to, that you invited me to run this session today, just as a as an, an extra option for thinking about kind of how to get into in, into into the DDD space. Um, so I mean, hopefully, it's useful for some people. We've now got okay. nine. I see ninety nine new messages that I've not yet read. This is amazing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's just Kenny chatting with Rebecca. Right. <laughs> Okay, orchestration as a service. There is a real uh, software as a service product where you can create a clickable customer journey. Uh, now we are not knowing how the business... Okay, so I, I think there is a separate comment from Christina. So okay. not knowing how the uh, how their, their business works is the real issue. Nobody should start splitting teams before clarifying these points. So this is a really good point, Christina. I'm really, I'm really glad you made this point because... Um, that actually goes to the heart of why we came up with these independent service heuristics because Team Topologies, the book, um, is, you know, is talking about how to arrange teams for a fast flow of change. Um, that does kind of assume that the organization knows what those fast flows are and actually, in quite a lot of organizations, like I said, they, they, they're just not aware what, what those kind of sets of flow actually really look like or should look like. And so we can't start splitting up teams, like you say, before actually really understanding how the business properly works or should work. Um, and so, yeah, independent service heuristics were there to try, and, to try and help organizations to start to understand how their business actually works effectively, to start understanding where the different customers are, where the different flows of change are, where the separate service boundaries should be or ought to be or really are already. And so on. So I, I, that's an absolutely spot on point from uh, from you, Christina. I think that's n nobody should start splitting teams before clarifying how their business works. OK, 
Okay. So I skipped a couple of comments that we already discussed. Uh, so that's from Ben. DDD is a good way to create services. I mean, modeling is a good way to pick what services to build. So does that relate to, you know, core generic supporting and deciding what's actually core for your business, Ben? I'm going to... I'm going to remind people that you can actually join us and talk to us as well. <laughs> it's an option. So the question from Ben, I don't know enough about. Um, maybe okay, Cas yeah. Cas Casper or Kenny or or, uh, or or someone else might want to join in that one. Right. But which, which question was it? Exactly? Uh, so it, it, it'll be like oh, it'll be like eight forty-one for you, Kenny. It's from Ben saying DDD is a good way to create services. Domain modeling is a good way to pick what services to build. Question mark. Domain modeling is a good way to pick what services to build. Um, so, yeah, for me, DDD at its core is, yeah, it, it's it, it's a good way to create services. But for me, it's more of a, the bounded context is actually a linguistic pattern and not and not a surface pattern or a system pattern, if you know what I mean. So it, it looks for independent way where languages stays or can stay consistent over time. Uh, and, and that's that's what people usually, now it's all microservices thing, right? Where DDD popped in. Uh, I think there's still a lot of um, misunderstanding about the bounded context pattern, which makes sense because we discussed it with Rebecca before. Patterns are there usually for people who understand already the patterns who are more of a um, on uh, expert level DDD sort of say. And that, that's the problem explaining bounded context. But uh, in, in a way you want to see, it needs to have a purpose and it needs to have a consistent language. And consistent language, I mean, um, I th think we're here with people from America and the UK and Eric Evans make this jokes about, uh, I think he called it a pudding. And pudding is rather inconsistent. <laughs> So as DDD, we look at ways where the language actually splits. Do you know what I mean? And that's why it's so hard to understand because it gets more fussy for most people because you don't talk about any ta anything tangible. It's just as fussy, I think, maybe, sorry to say it, but cognitive load is also this more of a, it's not rational math, right? Like one plus one equals two. Uh, it's it's a indicator, and cognitive load is an indicator, and language is another indicator. And I think we had this discussion before that that, uh, that I th think it popped up now three times. Um, bounded context in, in the DDD scene is hard to grasp for people the same way maybe cognitive load for people is hard to grasp. But maybe we should treat them more as indicators towards surface boundaries because that's easier for people to grasp. Make the entrance and that's why i like this make the entrance easier uh for people to explore hopefully that makes a bit more sense yeah it it, it definitely does it, it it makes me um it makes me realize that uh, it should definitely have a question in this list about vocabulary like we had we had a suggestion before from someone i can't remember who it was talking about you know is there different vocabulary in this area versus that area and so I, I i can definitely yeah. see that having a question or even more than one question about vocabulary and shared meaning and things is going to be a really useful thing for this list yeah and 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 to also account for that pure puristic ddd yes you want one surface per bounded context and maybe several microservices for bounded context but hey we're not in react we're, we're not in the happy unicorn land right as they say <laughs> So uh, that what makes DDD a lot harder to grasp because when you plot bounded context on current situation, it's going to be a lot harder for people. So I hope that answered that question. There is one and small maybe point. Maybe Nick or Casper had something to add. I'm not sure. I need to make one small point about your your comment, okay. Kenny, which is that the word pudding has about a hundred different meanings inside the UK. Never mind in America, right? So it's <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's a uh, it's a good conf uh, Eric. 
Eric Evans explains it right. He went to his UK friend in America and UK friend asked, do you want pudding? And he said, yes. And then he got dessert. So not the actual pudding. And that says, well, for me, I could still eat the pudding. But if you think of it in terms of surface boundaries, then a surface might not be able to handle a different pudding or a different type of pudding. And that's, that's why the language goes in and the consistency a lot around published language. I actually like that quote. We have a lot of them in the Netherlands too. And I think a lot of countries has this inconsistency in language uh, jokes. You can, ask, right? you can ask Matthew what T means in Yorkshire. So <laughs> <laughs> see, here we go. <laughs> yeah. uh, so there was a question from Nick that he would like to, he would like to see something involving evolution over time. I imagine that's around the heuristics that, that, that you have on the list. Yeah. yeah. So whether it's something that I don't, I'm just coming up with, with ideas right now, but maybe is there a service that, you know, we can put a specific boundary around because potentially in the future we'll be able to replace it with something, uh, replace it with something off the shelf. Yeah. And you know, safe on implementation time and so on. Yep. So kind of wardly mapping style stuff, right. evolution towards commodity. Or whatever. Yeah. So I have a question regarding. So wordly mapping came up a number of times now. So wordly has this model of pioneers, settlers, and town planners. Uh, what he is saying that for each of these, you know, types of uh, types of users or team members. Uh, you, you will have different composition of teams. And he's saying for pioneers, for example, you would have small teams that can, you know, uh, just research and, de and development. And he recommends like say three people in a team, which, which isn't in line with what team topologists say. And on the other hand, for town planners, for, you know, just running the operations and having like, you know, uh, large IT organizations where they just need large support teams and so on. That's again, not, not, not that's not in line with the team topologies model that you, that you presented in the book. So I wanted to ask your opinion on that. How, how these two models of pioneer settlers and tone planners and people topologies align there, where they are applicable and where they differ. Well, that's really interesting because um, from our point of view, we were quite influenced by the Wardley mapping stuff. Um, so in team topologies, we, I mean, this is a little bit, little bit off topic, but um, we, we talk about different uh, team interaction modes. And so there's collaboration at certain points. So two teams working closely together. Um, to discover something. So that is the pioneer in the kind of pioneer space. We're having to evolve something very, very quickly. We're, we're just mm -hmm. getting something done. But then after that collaboration is finished, then we're expecting to establish something as a service, which is more like um, settler okay. or, or town planner, depending on how you arrange it. Um, and then you've got the kind of, um, you've got the enabling team acting in a facilitating way across multiple other teams to try and um, detect where there are problems, detect, detect where, we're, where we need to change how we're using technology or change what kind of capability we've got in the team. So that also speaks to more like kind of the town planning bit, but also to the, the whole de um, detecting when, when we need to uh, most switch and to, sort of, you, to, to consume the, the um, the commodity component or whatever. So instead of building it ourselves, we actually need, now need to consume this as a service from outside. And so we've we've got we've we've definitely we definitely were conscious of um, the world mapping stuff because we wanted to make sure that the the way in which teams interact should exactly enable an organization to look at its environment, to look at its internal and external environment, and be able to adapt how the teams are composed and how they interrelate so that they can actually take advantage of you know changes in the in the in the technology and business ecosystem so it's i i'll i'll, I'll probably follow up with you separately anyway on that it'd be interesting to see why why you why you took that away from uh, for, from your reading of team technologies and maybe that's something that i need to or me and my co-author manuel we need to kind of expand a bit and and and, and bring to the surface a bit more all right Thank you. Okay. Uh, so there is a bunch of links in the chat 
from Nick and Rebecca and Kenny as well. So Rebecca is saying uh, that there are many ways to get at heuristics. A link coffee is a good to, uh, way to gather some heuristics too. Uh, and Rebecca is suggesting we have an online session exploring different heuristics. So maybe maybe that's a good idea. That that's what we can do next at this meetup. Yeah. Right. So I maybe I can just recommend people to you know review the links that Rebecca posted. Maybe can I think we can add them to the uh, to YouTube to the com uh, to description later on. Right. To include all the yes, all the we can. And I will send the chat uh, save the chat and. Uh... Okay. I share it. I'm still have don't have a solution for that yet. Easy, but all right. So Nick said that he wrote some stuff about capability aligned versus product aligned uh, some time ago. So that's another link that's on the chat. What else do we have here? So there's an interesting question from Christina. Uh, here, which is so there's some good questions, but these questions are not going deep enough for me. Um, okay. but it's the first goal is to understand what my company is doing, it's a very good start. So, thank you, Christina. Some, some good points that you're making. Um, I that, that doesn't surprise me that the, the questions aren't going deep enough because, um, that's that sort of fits with the nature of these questions and how, how I've used them so far. Um, because it's it's for organisations that are at the very beginning of their journey in terms of understanding really understanding what what how how their own business works and getting started with approaches like you know DDD. Um, but I guess it would be nice if the if this list could kind of expand and become more useful to people so that it does go a bit deeper and 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 meets I guess some needs that you're thinking about yourself so that you could use these in some uh, in, in a bit more bit more of an involved way maybe in your organization or organizations you you work with so i mean i'm i'd be super super happy to see this this list evolve into something that is a bit more uh is a bit deeper so coming from rebecca it would be good to gather some info about what people actually do and the answers that they have to these questions and i think we could learn a lot, a lot from that too So that, that would be a good way of distilling how really people use it, right? Yeah. So Kenny, what do you think about having a session of, you know, you know, coming up with more heuristics like that? Yeah. Like group exploration. I'm, I'm uh, case studies. Yeah. I'm trying to do that uh, with Rebecca. I asked her a couple of times, even had a question, right? About what is a heuristic? So uh, many times, but I definitely, and, and that's one in the chat that Rebecca says, uh, ddheuristics.com, we try to capture all, all sorts of heuristics. So uh, it will be fun. It's GitHub, it's open, it's also uh, Creative Commons, and people can add it there. It's a jackal plate. And uh, for now, it's just sharing and dumping. And at some point, we'll start curating. And I'm actually trying now to make this um, decision tree for event storming, for instance. I'm just experimenting with this because that's more of my, uh, I have a lot of knowledge there. I don't know, the other parts. There's a nice um, comment from Wazim who says, I like this heuristic checklist at the minimal, it will, at a minimum, it will avoid pushing us towards creating many small tightly coupled services, which are hard to reverse. And I think that's a, it's a good point. We're, we're we're trying to we're trying to avoid making one of these one of these big distributed monoliths effectively. Monoliths. Yeah. Uh, right. So, comment from Christina is that challenging decisions should be a best practice. I agree with that. And um, another limitation is that people don't know about all the more recent techniques. I think that was related, uh, that's related to what I was talking about, the entry barrier, barrier to the management design. Uh, that people are just now not aware of this, all, all these new tools and techniques like event storming. I agree with that, no. so. So uh, just to also, we're trying to set up at the virtual DDD, I'm talking to see, see if we can set up resources and uh, curate resources and get some 
for people to get some entry point level and, and this would definitely help but we're still looking for ways how to set up these resources correctly in one uh, because there's there's all over the place resources right there's github pages and everything how can we collect all these and curate it hopefully we, we can put it onto one flag towards all these sites that is already there of course yep so how how much time do you have left matthew I just want to, uh, I can just wrap up a few different things and point people. There's a couple of things I want to share as well. And then, mm -hmm. then, then, then we're done, basically. Um, I just want to, before we, before we go any further, just want to thank everyone for all the, all the input. It's been really, really useful for me. Hopefully it's been useful for you. Just the discussion as well as seems, seems to have been useful for, for lots of people. Um, basically, if you've got any more views or, or input, then uh, you know, send us an email if you want to info at teamtopologies.com or you'll find us on Twitter and LinkedIn. Just search for Team Topologies. You'll find us there and see what we're doing and, and give, us some, um, give us some feedback. Um, oh, I should, I should give you the, oh, the, the, the link to the GitHub repository is in, um, is in the chat, but I'll just go straight back there right now so that you can see it. So if you just search GitHub for Team Topologies, again, you'll find us there, and it's called Independent Service Heuristics. So see, you know, send us a pull request or, or, or some comments or whatever, and, and we'll, um, we'll, we'll look to incorporate lots of these good ideas. Um, a quick, a quick shout-out for some training that I'm running on May the 22nd, which is a Friday, uh, running some training for... Uh, uh, that's focused on team boundaries and architecture for fast flow. So we've got uh, 15 people uh, in total. I think we've got about six uh, spaces left on that training. So if you're interested, head to teamtopologies.com slash events. There's a bunch of other training that we're running as well, um, all different, different kinds of um, aspects around kind of organization design and software delivery. I mentioned before this book, uh, which will be, coming out soon, published by IT Revolution Press, the people who published the Team Topologies book itself. And it will be a kind of workbook with some exercises and practical things around uh, remote, remote teams. And if you still want more, then sign up for some news. Uh, teamtopologies.com, we've got a newsletter and uh, we, don't, we don't spam you. Well, we, to be honest, so far we've barely sent out any newsletters at all. So we, we probably need to send more. But um, you, you'll get some useful information about when, when things are happening. Um, and that's what we look like, in case you can't see on the video. I'm on the left and Manuel's on the right. Uh, so, yeah, just thank you to every, thank you to, um, thank you to Casper and, and, and Nick and Kenny for organizing and running it. And thanks to everyone who's kind of chipped in and asked questions and comments and things. It's been really useful for me, really, really interesting. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you, Matthew, for preparing for this session and, you know, spending time with us. I know you, you, it's challenging with the baby at home and so on, so I really appreciate that. Okay. Do we have any more questions? I know there was discussion what is what is the difference between uh, domain modeling and DDD, but I think we can park it for another time. All right. So a lot of thanks from from people. So I think that was useful, and thank you for the participation again. I hope we can do another joint event soon with virtual DDD. Yeah, let's run that uh, uh, heuristic hunting thing. So um, shall we uh, close the stream and wrap up? So that's good. Thank you. If anyone haven't seen, well, virtual DDD spams, as it seems uh, last Friday <laughs> on the meetup page, but this Friday we'll have a whole day of conferences. So uh, Check it out at our site and uh, hope to see you next time. And uh, that was it. Thanks everyone for coming. And I'm going to stop the live stream now and we'll talk after. <laughs>